This is my mammal representative. <laughs> he is a mammal. He's not real. He's not very well trained, in other words. So right here, this is a California ground squirrel. California ground squirrels are a somewhat common squirrel to the area. Um, these squirrels, hence the name ground squirrel, they live entirely in the earth, pretty much. They don't really live in trees. They rarely are in trees. Every once in a while, you find one maybe sitting on a stump or a fence post, something kind of low to the ground like that. And he'd be sitting just like you see him here on his back feet, just sitting straight up, like squirrels sometimes do. Ground squirrels like this, they kind of, best similarity I can give you to their social structure is very similar in, in a way to meerkats. We need to watch meerkat manor. They live in family groups. I do not know, however, if they're matriarchal or patriarchal as far as the meerkats <laughs> were matriarchal. So I don't know about that. But I do know they live in family groups. And the little one you see on the fence post is the lookout and also the bait, if anything comes by. <laughs> He's the lookout and the bait. What's really interesting about these guys is they have a call that you would not think comes from a squirrel at all. They have a very loud <coughs> sounds like a car alarm. And actually, it doesn't even sound like a car alarm. I heard the sound one time in the nature center, and I realized, oh, it's the smoke detector battery is going out. Isn't that loud? <coughs> that's, what it, that's exactly what it sounds like. And it's so high pitched, you wouldn't think it comes from a squirrel. When you hear that call, that's an alarm call that that little squirrel's given out. So the lookout here saw something. Who knows what it is? I've walked by lookouts. I looked around going, well, I don't see a hawk. I don't see anything. He could be seeing a snake in the grass. He could be seeing anything that we don't see or hear. And he's alerting the rest of his group because the rest of his group were around him on the ground in the grass. And they're foraging for seeds and all types of stuff like that. The other thing these guys eat, I know a lot of times we look at squirrels and we think, oh, cute little seed plant herbivore squirrels actually omnivores. I didn't believe it until I saw it with my own eyes, and it was rather disturbing. <laughs> These guys will actually eat little fledgling birds. I saw it with my own eyes. I didn't believe it. I saw a ground squirrel hopping along our sidewalk, and I saw it carrying something in its mouth. I'm like, oh, it's a baby squirrel. I got all excited. I walk over. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a dead bird. And it was just carrying the dead bird, and it walked, dragged into its burrow, and that was the end of the bird. So it's amazing when you study animals. A lot of times we look at animals like the squirrels and we think, oh, the nut eating, the plant eating, or even the ducks. We think, oh, the little microscopic insects eating ducks. They eat a lot more than that. And it's really incredible when you actually look in their list in the books. They actually list in the books that these guys do eat birds. Little baby, little baby birds and little fledglings. They actually list it in the books. But with our common concept of things can sometimes be a little skew when it comes to reality, which is really incredible. When I, talked, I mentioned ducks, um, I have heard and seen Mallard ducks eating crawdads. How they do it with that flat bill, I have no idea. But I have seen them with a the crawdad in their mouth trying to break open the shell to eat it before, so really incredible. Um, to identify these guys, A, they're going to be not in a tree. So that's going to be easy to identify them. They are dark gray with white speckles. Sometimes they'll have, this guy kind of has a little bit kind of a white band on the back of the neck. Sometimes it connects, this one not really connected, but they have a white spot on the back of the neck, kind of like a backwards bib. And their tail is very skinny. They don't have the nice big bushy tail like our tree squirrels. So hence, they're just not really used for balance. They, when they run, they will raise that tail straight up just like a meerkat, which is kind of cute when they're running. But otherwise, they really don't keep that tail up. They'll usually leave it down when they're foraging and stuff. And so they really don't use it much for balance as far as climbing. Yeah. Because they get the fledglings. Yeah. So, yeah, the ones that fall out of the trees, definitely. Go out and grab this yeah. Place. The other thing that's really fascinating about these is if um, you read science journals and um, stuff, you may have heard about this that ground squirrels like this are immune to rattlesnake venom or rattlesnakes are present. How that happened, we don't know. But um, Davis did a study and they found that these uh, ground squirrels will actually torment a rattlesnake if it comes into their area. And when they got bit, the venom didn't harm them at all. However, in populations of ground squirrels where there are no rattlesnakes, they are not immune to the venom. They don't. So how this happened, we really don't know. Again, it's something that was just found out in the last five years. So scientists are still studying it, still trying to figure out how these populations are able to gain immunity to rattlesnakes. But I've actually heard that they will, um, I think they eat the skins or something they like that. They just find the old shed and they'll actually eat them. 
But I don't know if that's what causes the immunity. I went down it. That sounds kind of pokey pokey to me. But they're really incredible little squirrels. Um, they, but again, they need areas where they can dig tunnels. So big flat areas where they can dig tunnels and have good lookouts. That's where you're going to find these guys. They are also found in the woods, though, too. We do have a few of them in the woods. And every once in a while, you'll find their burrows along the river. Uh, what we have here in probably El Dorado Hills, we have more mule deer. But down in the valley, we have black-tailed deer, which are very closely related to mule deer. They have a solid black tail. Mule deer, my understanding, have a black tip tail with a little white at the top. And that's really the only difference between the two. Other than that, they're the exact same size. Both have the big ears, hence the name mule deer. Stuff like that. So this right here is a skull from a buck, obviously. And what I wanted to talk about is something that people don't always know, and that's about these, these things right here, the antlers. A lot of times people call them horns. Um, to be correct, they are antlers, technically. And the reason is, I'm going to show why, because I have another skull here. These are horns. This is from a pronghorn antelope, if you're wondering what critter this is. Pronghorn antelopes are the only antelope found in North America. They're more typically found um, in Wyoming today, like near uh, Yellowstone. That's where you usually will find them. However, I have heard that there are some kind of scattered around in Idaho and some little populations and herds in there. These originally were here many, many years ago. There were herds throughout the valley of Sacramento of pronghorn antelope. But the difference is you can tell I'm holding this one by the antler here. I can't hold this one by the horn because those always come off. Horns are a growth that go over a piece of the actual skull of the animal. So this is actually part of the skull, and this is kind of a protrusion. These grow over that protrusion. Antlers are actually a part of the skull itself. They're solid. They're on there. Now, antlers are made out of solid bone. Horns, like the one on here, is actually made out of keratin, the same things as our fingernails and our hair. And Go ahead and pass that around. You'll notice they're hollow. You can kind of see little hairs and stuff that are in there as well. Pass them both around. That's fine. But horns are permanent because they actually cover that part of the actual skull of the animal. So they're permanent. Antlers, on the other hand, are not permanent. They fall off. Here's one that fell off. Our bucks are right now losing their antlers. All of them. They're all just going to plop, just fall off the ground. Sometimes they shake their head and they fall off, but it doesn't harm the buck at all. It's just shedding the antlers. They just fall off and shed, and they land on the ground. Mm -hmm. As you can tell, this is solid. Here, this is solid bone. This is about as solid as the bone in your arms and your legs. Mm -hmm. So a nice big piece of bone here, even though it looks like wood. A lot of kids go, it's made out of wood. Mm -hmm. I know, it's bone. But this what's really incredible about these is these are temporary. The bucks lose them every year, and they regrow them every year. Now, they wouldn't know why. Why do bucks have antlers? Mm. To fight. To fight who? Other bucks for females. Yeah. It's for dating. <laughs> whole purpose of the antlers to date. It's the whole purpose. A lot of times people, a lot of times when I ask children, they go, oh, it's for protection. It's like, well, that'd be great if you had it all year round. But you only have it for a few months out of the year. So these are just like she said, are just to fight those other bucks to get the date, to get the girl. It's the only reason they have a rutting season. Um, for the valley for us is roughly November through December is our rutting season down there. Rutting is when the two guys go after, go at each other. Our bucks look pretty bedraggled by the end of December with all the fighting they did throughout the couple months. And then roughly about, uh, I say late as March, sometimes it starts in February, the antlers will just fall off. They're done with them. They finished the rutting. They found the doe. They found their girl. And babies will be born in about May to June. They'll we'll start having the fawns. What's really incredible is all of, our ant all of our bucks lose their antlers roughly in about the same couple month period. How many of you seen an antler on the trail? I mean, think with all the deer we have, mm -hmm. we'd just be tripping over these. Mm -hmm. What do you suspect happens to them? This is what happens to them. Mm -hmm. They get eaten. Yeah, that's I know, it looks like a branch. You may have seen one like this and thought, oh, it's just a branch on the ground. Rodents eat antlers. Rodents chew on the antler, and as they chew on it, they actually shave it away and they eat it. Um, rodents, as we know, have the ever-growing front teeth that they need to keep trim at all times. This is nice and hard, so they can really help trim those front teeth down a little bit and wear them away. As well, this is very rich in calcium. On top of that, so your squirrels, your rats, your field mice, all those little critters are going to come 
chewing away. I know. Yeah, it doesn't go to waste. Nature knows how to take care of its own. I sat on as well as the... You can get an idea how heavy these things are, too, if you imagine. Bucks have two of those on their head at the same time. That's a big, that's a big heavy one. You also notice when the bucks have those, they have the, the bodybuilder necks. <laughs> and that's why, because they have to carry those huge antlers on their head. Yeah. Then do they get another prong every year? Is that how it goes? You know, or? I've heard that it varies. It depends on the health of the buck. But I haven't seen many with more than four um, down in the valley. So I don't want to say that they only live to be about four or five years old. Because um, we've had a few old bucks. You can just tell they only have about four four uh, points, but they look old. They just look huge and like beautiful stags. But they only have about four points. So I'm not sure if they only get so many and then that stops. Or as a health thing, I'm not sure. Um, but what I've heard is if they're really healthy, they should grow another point. If they had a year where they didn't get enough nutrients, they won't grow another point. And then you have those young bucks that somehow hit their heads or did something and they only have one as it was growing. We call those unicorns. <laughs> Little spikes sticking up like that. that grow? Let's see, they're losing it about now. They'll start growing in about another month or two. Start growing them back and they'll be full without the velvet. When they grow, they are covered in a velvet that is rubbed off. So it has that hard on the outside there. And that'll be done roughly around October, the month of October. So about half of a year almost, yeah. It takes a long time for bodies to grow that. <laughs> I know, it is a lot of work to get the girl. Well, that's only if two bucks see the same dough, so maybe he gets the ugly girl. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Um, but deer are rather fascinating critters. Um, they are complete herbivores. They, what's really interesting with the skull here is you'll notice they don't have top front teeth. This is the teeth here. They actually only have top bottom teeth, or front bottom teeth. So they don't have the top front teeth at all. They have. And that way, when they're eating branches, this can hold on and then just peel the leaves off the branches. Yeah, instead of like a horse jaw where they'll just snap the branch off if they try to bite onto that. That's where they can just help peel all the leaves off. Deer are basically foragers in the sense that uh, they will mostly look for bushes and stuff versus grass. They will eat grass, but they really want bushes and leaves. That's what they're really looking for. This interesting critter here is, of course, a beaver skull. This is the exact size of a beaver skull. They are rather large critters. They are rodent, largest in North America. Beavers can reach about 100 pounds, so very large critters. They can get huge. Beavers um, are fascinating critters. They do mostly eat plants. They don't eat fish. Sometimes people think that they're able to eat fish. They're, they're plain herbivores for the most part. How you can tell that is definitely by their teeth and their jaw. They have flat grinding teeth in the back. And that's the sign of a herbivore, much like our teeth are grinding in the back. Their front teeth are in a chisel shape. And I did not paint the teeth, by the way. This is the exact color of the beaver's teeth. They are an orangey color. The reason they're that orangey color is that orange color is just a layer that goes over and it's a harder enamel on the tooth than the rest of the tooth. So as they're chewing and biting down on things, that edge will stay there, but as you can tell, it kind of makes a chisel shape and wears down more towards the back of the tooth to make that chisel shape so when they eat the wood, instead of having a flat tooth, it makes more of a chisel sharp point so they can turn off into that wood a little bit easier. We do sometimes have beavers on the river. However, they're mostly in slow moving water areas. So at the Nature Center, we don't have a beaver family because our river, stretch of river goes pretty quick. There's part of the river. But what's also amazing about beavers is they spend their time in that river all year round. Any of you have gone down to the river in the winter time and touched that water? I don't think the first thought in your head is jump in. It's very cold water. It can get to like 40 degrees. It's cold water. Beavers, however, have very special adaptation. Their fur is double layered. As I move back, you'll see this kind of like this light, spiky color, and then this really thick, dark underneath. Beaver pelts, uh, beaver fur, this darker layer here is so thick, it's actually waterproof. The water will not soak into their skin and give them a chill. It keeps their skin protected from the chill of the water. What actually gets wet is the long, light colored hairs. 
as you see, kind of that slick look on the beaver is from that. Well, I know about how mammals have great fur adaptations. We know a lot of our pets at home, they shed, they, you know, have that animal shedding, regrowing the fur. So great at, fur is a great adaptation in the sense that you can get you nice and thick and warm in the wintertime, and then in the summertime you can lose half of it without losing all of it, and kind of helps keep you a little bit cool. Um, beavers, another great adaptation, helps keep them protected by the cold water with that really, really super thick fur. But there's one critter that uses fur as a calling card. <laughs> And that's a skunk. His fur pattern on here is just a calling card. He is a nocturnal critter, so being black, awesome color for being a nocturnal out at night. However, the white, as we know, is the color you want to wear if you want to be seen. So his mixture here is kind of a little off if you think about a critter that may not want to get bothered, but his striping is basically a calling card, letting other critters and everyone else know, I'm a skunk, please don't mess with me. Skunks are actually uh, pretty calm little critters in the sense that I heard that they don't really um, spray you unless they have a reason. They will warn you unless you really, I guess, surprise them <laughs> completely. They will give you a chance to warn you. They will stomp their feet, is what they'll do. So there's like this kind of a stomping of a foot. And then they, then they will spray you if you don't like <laughs> You don't get the stomping of the feet, they'll, then they'll spray you. Actually, I heard they only carry about four tablespoons of spray on them at a time which isn't very much if you think about it. So more, than more than enough for the smell, but if you think about a critter that uses that as a defense, it's really not a lot. And his body makes energy in order to make that scent, that scent gland. But what I thought was fascinating is they can actually direct that spray. They actually, that gland that it comes out of can actually, they can point it in different directions. So they can do it where it's a direct spray, if they can see the predator, or if they can't see the predator, they can make it a mist spray that goes everywhere. So, yeah, clever little thing. The one thing about skunks is they don't smell all the time. So I think a lot of people think that if a skunk's out, they'll smell it because they just have BO and they just stink all the time. And that's not the case. The only time you smell a skunk is when it sprays. Because I know we have thousands of skunks throughout the Sacramento <laughs> metropolitan area, and you don't smell them every night. However, I know they're there because the nights that we do smell them lets us know, oh, there's a skunk in the area. But we don't smell it every night. And I always tell people, if we could smell skunks all the time. They really, if their fur and everything stuck so bad, we could smell them everywhere we go. We would smell skunk. <laughs> yeah, but we know when it's mating season. Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, they must get stuck during that. Yeah. I, I heard that they travel in about a three-mile radius. Is that roughly? It's I've heard about two miles. Okay. So roughly about two-mile radius, they'll travel around. Again, they're just looking for food. They're just yeah. kind of moseying along, just looking for stuff to eat. They are actually not in the weasel family, and I can't remember the name of the family they're in now, I'm forgetting it, but they actually found they're not related to weasels. They're on their own branch of the tree. They found weasels. Really, for years they were grouped with the weasel family, and now they've been branched off just recently. I do want to show this because, I don't have a picture of this critter, but this is an opossum skull. And opossums, a lot of times uh, people look at them and they think they're related to rats. Because granted, they look like a big rat. They have the round ears, the long tail. But they actually aren't related to rats at all. And opossums are, do anyone know what family they're in? Marsupials. Marsupials. Opossums have a pouch on their belly to carry their babies, just like a kangaroo does. So that's their closest relative, are kangaroos. No family resemblance, I know. But <laughs> that's their closest relative. Opossums um, are not rodents at all. I like to bring the skull out here because you can see that he doesn't have little front big rodent teeth like the beaver and everybody else has. Beaver has lots of little sharp teeth. Opossums are omnivores, they're scavengers. They'll eat snails and all types of stuff like that, rotting fruit. So they're good at cleaning up your yard if you have fruit trees or snails in your yard. You would think that as. Actually, they're not that aggressive if you don't grab a hold of one. <laughs> so you grab a hold of one, I can't guarantee um, how safe you'll be. Um, however, opossums, if you just give them their space, their main line of defense is to play dead. Can the occur being that aggressive that that's their main line of defense is to play dead? Um, but however, if you grab a hold of one, it won't bite because it'll think that you're trying to eat it. So that's how dogs and stuff sometimes get bitten up by opossums because they grab a hold of one. Um, opossums will try to run away. However, they are really bad at running away. <laughs> they basically walk away. They basically walk away. They don't. I remember when we used to walk our opossum, this is years ago at the Nature Center, we used to put the opossum on the sidewalk and just walk with it. 
And I could walk faster than that opossum as it was walking along. They just aren't very good walkers. They are excellent climbers, though. And that tail that you see is uh, partially prehensile, so not fully prehensile. So they, they can use it to wrap around branches and wrap around things. However, they do not sleep hanging upside down on their tail. <laughs> That's a myth. That's a total myth. Sorry, Bambi. It's just totally, and they don't carry the baby. Not hanging on the tail, no. Again, that's Bambi. I love Bambi, but watching it now as being older and knowing the facts is like, oh, <laughs> that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Um, so opossums, that tail, they can use it to curl around nesting materials, though, like leaves and dry grass, and carry it up in a tree to a nice place to nest. They, the babies might hang from their tail. If they fall from a branch, you might see one hanging from its tail for a moment. Adults, that tail is not strong enough to hold their weight. Opossums can weigh over like 10 to 15 pounds. They can weigh as big as, well as a large cat. So you look at that little tail, it's like, oh yeah, that can't hold that. It's not meant to hold that weight. Um, opossums also, I should have brought a track, but you look at their track, they have that back paw, it has that thing, that thumb going down. That's actually a fully opposable thumb like ours. Not even chips have that. However, it's on their back foot, and they don't know how to use it except to climb with. But I've actually heard that it's opposable just like ours on that back foot there. So they're actually incredible little critters. But the other cool thing about this skull here with all this little teeth is, as a human, we have about 32 teeth in our mouth our whole life. Not gonna get any more, maybe less, but you're not gonna get any more than 32 teeth in your life. Opossums, this little skull here has 50. Tiny little skull has 50 teeth. It has more teeth than any mammal, in, well, at least on this continent. I can't say for Africa and other places, but for what I know in the United States, it has more teeth than any mammal. That's here, which is pretty incredible. So opossums are pretty fascinating little critters. They are fully nocturnal, and they're not actually from here. That's the other thing. Opossums actually are from the east coast of the United States. They were brought here by pioneers because people like opossums too, which now nobody eats here, which is ironic. <laughs> in the south, in the southeast, they still eat it down there, but here in California, I don't really hear a lot of people eating opossums too around here. Oh, the menus. Birds, we have. Oh gosh, so many birds in our area. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about our raptors of the area here. Um, raptors in our area, uh, we have a lot. We have falcons, we have hawks, we have eagles, osprey, harriers, kites. Pretty much one from every big group that's out uh, here. This skull here belongs to a red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawks are, how we see them more up here than we do down there. They, they like big open fields, and along the river we don't have that, so we don't see that very much along the river. But we do have a lot of our red-shouldered hawks, which are the noisiest hawk in the world. I think they're extremely noisy. Uh, Red-tailed hawks, though, are very, very famous as far as Hollywood is concerned, because if you have watched a lot of movies and you, they're in a jungle or anything like that, or if you even um, watch a lot of like bald eagle footage, you might hear this. Bald eagles don't sound like this. They wish they did. <laughs> Bald eagles have this little, they have this little chirping sound. That's their call. But this is red-tailed hawk, which is the famous call. You hear this everywhere. Hollywood loves red-tailed hawk calls. You hear it everywhere. But red-tailed hawks are the ones, like I said, jungle scene, desert scene, forest scene, mountain scene. You hear this in the distance. Next time you watch a movie and it's outside, so just listen. <laughs> listen if they threw that hawk call in there. But they are very awesome hunters. They have about a four and a half foot wingspan red tailed hawks do. So one of our larger hawks. Not the largest though, but they're one of our more common larger hawks. They're found everywhere from the snow line or Arctic line up in Canada all the way down to Mexico. So they have a very wide, they're very they can live anywhere. They can live in deserts, forests. They're pretty versatile as far as their habitat is. The other one I brought. Similar, but a lot different. This is a great horned owl skull. Yeah, look at those eyes. They got huge eyes. Owls are night hunters for the most part. Uh, burrowing owls are the only daytime owl that we have in the valley here. Uh, but for the most part, the rest of our owls are nighttime only. Great horned owls, uh, sometimes they call them crepuscular. They have that yellow in their eye. They call them that crepuscular. Crepuscular means that they'll come out in or be out at dawn, so when they'll be out. 
uh, to, to counter that, barn owls have solid black eyes. They come out only when the moon is out. When it's solid dark night, there's no sunlight left, and that's when those owls will come out. But these guys come out in the heat of time. So think about owls. They have huge eyes. Their eyes are so big, in fact, that they have to turn their heads because they cannot turn their eyeballs. Um, this is a little thing I did. Hold your fist up. I want you to look at your fist. I want to, as you look at your fist, I'm going to tell you that if I turned you into an owl, you stay the same size as you are now, but you are an owl, your eyeball would be the size of your own fist. <laughs> Their eyes are so huge, they don't have any muscle left in that eye socket to help move that eyeball around. So their eyes are fixed looking straight all the time. As a result, they need to turn their head. Now, owls cannot turn their head all the way around. If they did a full 360, their head would pop off. <laughs> or if they did like the cartoon owls like in Bambi and go like this, that's an exorcist owl. <laughs> and um, need to call somebody to help us out with that one. But owls for the general, the most that they can do, 360 full circle from beginning to finish, they can do about 270 at most. Which is a little over half, which is pretty incredible. And they can do it really fast. Too. So if you blink, it might look like a big full circle if you blink, uh, because they, or they can spin their head around pretty quick. But I'm going to show you, just to give you an idea how far 270 is generally, I'm going to turn this little skull around here, and 270 is sure, right about there. That's one way. That's pretty incredible. A little over half. Just one way. The reason owls' eyes are so big compared to hawks is they're out at night. And being out at night, generally in the woods, all you have is moonlight and starlight, which is very little light at all to go by. So they have that very little light to help feed into their eyesight so they can see at all. Whereas this is a turkey wing. It's from wild turkey. Very colorful. This is a barn owl wing. I'm going to flap both these wings, and I want to know which one you can hear, or which one's the loudest of the two. You probably already know this. Versus. If I had a hawk wing, it would sound just like this turkey wing. It would still have that flapping sound of a hawk wing. Owls are able to ambush their prey because they have that silent flight. Their feathers are extremely soft. Yeah, there's an extra little fringe. It's very hard to see. We can kind of see a little bit right there. There's a little extra fringe of feathers as well. This is a, this is a great horned owl. This is what I call the typical owl coaster owl call. Everyone always thinks the hoo, 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 of the great horned owl. Then you have Screech Owl. Which is not going to be anything you're going to think it is. That's Western Screech Owl. They don't screech. So I don't know. I, I, apparently they're called Screech Owls because they're closely related to the Eastern Screech Owl. But I guess the Eastern Screech Owl screeches. I'm not sure. <laughs> I know our ones here in the West do not screech. And they're very small, but they have a little bouncing ball hoot. Um, if you hear a screech, Typically, we'll find human areas to live in. 
does not necessarily need to be a barn. Just an abandoned could be someone's attic. If they never go in their attic and they have an opening in their attic they're not aware of, an abandoned house or anything like that. Even palm trees. I've heard these guys nesting in palm trees as well. Um, yeah, as long as there's no flash, because the flash will hurt her eyes. So we ask no flash for her. But this here is Luna. <laughs> Luna is about nine years old. She's been at the Nature Center for roughly about eight and a half years. Luna's story is about eight and a half years ago, maybe a little longer than that, she fell from her nest during a storm. So this big storm and her, whole, her and her nest mates were just not clean out of where they were nesting at during the storm. It was out in Davis. She was brought to the Davis Raptor Center, known as the California Raptor Center today by UC Davis, as a re to be rehabilitated and released back into the wild. However, every time they fed Luna here, she kept regurgitating her food back up. She wasn't keeping it down, and they feared that she possibly hit her head and got brain damage from the fall. She had to be hand-fed as a result, and as a result of being hand-fed, she became an imprint on people. Luna today can eat fine on her own. She doesn't need any help from anyone. She prefers no help from anyone today. Um, Luna's one of those, I was always jokingly call her a diva. She's one of those that in front of the public eye, oh, behind doors. <laughs> so <laughs> that's Luna to a T. She definitely has a big personality. Uh, being a bar now, she's very territorial of her space, and that's one of the little e moments is that we get from her. She has dive bomb staff in her enclosure. She tries to bite at the glove and grabs a hold of it and all that other type of stuff, which we're so glad we have thick leather gloves as a result. Um, but Luna's been with us for, like I said, eight and a half years. She's been with us for a long time. She is fully flighted, so um, we do not do flying presentations, though, so she's not going to be flying in the room here. She would not come back to me if I did that, <laughs> which would not be fun. Um, what else to say about Luna here? Yes. But how big is the area that she lives in? I, mean, I would say it's about roughly as big as a little kitchen area in there. So she can actually fly just a little bit. A little bit, yeah. But yeah, that's where she is. We, we are not trained falconers, and most of the birds that we have are not able to fly. She's a rarity in that sense, and she is fully able to fly, but she's an imprint. It's not only problem. If we released her into the wild, she would look for somebody to feed her. She wouldn't know how to hunt or things like that. And I get, all, I get that question, well, what about instinct? It's like, well, she may have instinct, but she might mess up. And then she would starve to death. She, it's like, I know I should eat that mouse running, but I've never seen a mouse run before. Usually when I get them, they're frozen. <laughs> so she would look at it going, I'm not quite sure. It looks like I'm something I'm supposed to eat, but it doesn't look the same. <laughs> It does take time. They say it's okay to your cats out in the field and say you've got but they stop them before they learn how to, you know. Yeah, that's true. Thing. Instincts, instincts aren't immediate. Mm -hmm. It's like for us, instinctually, we should be able to survive on our own in the wild because our ancestors <laughs> may have had to hundreds of thousands, you know, thousands of years ago. Um, but I'm sure if any of us were just thrown out in the wilderness, like man versus wild, we would sit there going, help, <laughs> <laughs> cell phone signal. <laughs> All I want is the beaver <laughs> <laughs> Like that. So that's why we have Luna with us. Um, Luna has laid eggs. Um, at the Nature Center, she is not a foster mom though, so her eggs are just like the chicken eggs you get in the store. There is no babies in them whatsoever. She just got off nesting about a month ago. What's really incredible about barn owl nesting is they will lay up to six eggs. However, they will lay them in daily increments. They'll lay one egg, wait a few days, lay another egg, wait a few days, lay another egg, wait a few days, and so on and so forth. The reason they do that is when that first laid egg hatches, mom and dad can just focus on that one baby get it nice and strong, give it its first couple days to get it nice and strong and healthy. Next one hatches. Focus on that one a lot. Make sure it's nice and strong. And that way you don't have six all at once chirping at you when they're newborns, because you know newborns need the most help. So that way they can kind of space it out and they have a higher rate of survival for the chicks as a result of that. Barn owls are monogamous, like most raptors. However, they do not hang out with each other all year round. What's really interesting about raptors is they only hang out with their significant other during the breeding and, and nesting season. After that, they don't hang out with each other again. 
And what's kind of sweet is when they find each other again, when that season comes around, they will look for that same partner again, and they will actually court each other again when they find each other. Yes? Do owls and hawks uh, return to their nests, or do they find new nests every year? I don't know about owls. They stay, will normally stay in the same area, whether or not they go to the exact same spot they had a nest, I'm not sure. I have heard that red-shouldered hawks do, definitely. And not only that, they will share their nesting spots with their offspring. So you'll have generation after generation after generation coming in the same area. Um, her beak is hard to see, she's a very pale pink beak at the end of that crest right there. What's neat about that crest that's over her face right there is that will actually flatten when she's fully asleep and cover her eyes like this. Mm -hmm. So then you can't see her eyes at all. It's like a little makeshift blind her, her eyes. Um, the facial disc is that round part you see on her head. Facial discs are satellite dishes for sound. All owls have a facial disc of some measure. Barn owls have the most severe one. You can really tell them they're barn owl. If you look at great horned owl, you can kind of see around the eyes a little bit. There's some that the barn, barn owls are the ones with the full facial disc. As a result, they're amazing hunters, absolutely amazing hunters. I've heard that the uh, barn owl can find a field mouse in the size of foot, in the area size of a football field in less than a minute by using its ears, which is pretty incredible. They are the mouse hunter elite, is what I've heard. However, they will eat a whole bunch of other stuff. They will eat bats, they will eat lizards, they will eat birds, they will eat snakes. <laughs> they will eat a whole, whatever they can find at night that they can eat, they will hunt it down. Um, and of course, we know that by looking at their pellets and finding out what they ate by studying them. Here's the false. Uh, snakes, like most reptiles, it is sometimes very difficult to tell between male and female. Um, there's not a size difference like with birds. There's not a coloring difference uh, like with some animals. And unlike mammals, the organs that usually will tell us are internal. So there's really no way to e e easily uh, tell if a snake's a male or a female. Except when they lay eggs, that's a good, <laughs> good sign right there. Now again, just like Luna, she was by herself when she laid her eggs. So she doesn't um, have any, we don't have any babies. We don't do breeding at the nature center. We want animals to be free if they can be give a haven to those who can't. Um, so Bullseye here, the reason she's at the Nature Center is she was found in a parking lot at a mall. Just out in the parking lot, running away from cars, basically, from my understanding. And that was about 12 years ago. She's about 12 years old now. Um, because we did not know where she came from, and we did not know if she was originally a pet, because king snakes are sold in pet stores, she was deemed non-releasable. Um, that's common story with a lot of snakes because they, you don't know the exact location or their background, they are often deemed non-releasable as a result. Um, so Bullseye's been with us for 12 years. This is roughly the common size for a king snake, I would say for the largest size. We do have one in the nature center that's larger than her, it's another female, however, um, she's in captivity, so when I bring her out, she looks like a mini python almost. And people go, oh my gosh, like, well, she's inside, you know, it's not, they're not going to get this big in the wild. But I would say for bulls, I hear this is about your typical size. Being a king snake, she is immune to rattlesnake venom. She does eat rattlesnakes if she's in the wild. They are not on rattlesnake vendettas, however, so they don't just run the countryside looking for rattlesnakes. They, of course, will eat rats and mice and bird eggs and lizards and whatever else they can find, just like most critters. But they are special in that they can eat rattlesnakes as well. These guys are non-venomous at all. The only venomous snake in the state of California is a rattlesnake. Um, there's about six species of rattlesnakes in the state of California, six to eight, I think. Most of them are down south. In this part of California, we have the Northern Pacific rattlesnake. It's the type that we have here. And they are actually pretty mellow, really. Comparatively, if you compare it to a diamondback, these guys are mellow that we have up here in Sacramento. Um, Snakes like this, she is a constrictor, so she wraps around and overpowers her prey in order to get it. She does swallow it whole. She does have teeth, but she does not have fangs. Another uh, misconception I hear from people is that, oh, all snakes have fangs. Like, well, they only have fangs if they have venom. She has teeth, though, still. She has little sharp hooked teeth that curve back to her throat like this. Just tiny, like, little needle-like teeth. And those teeth are basically there to help hold her. Food. Yeah, a gopher snake looks a lot more like a rat -like compared to a king. Of course, the pattern on here could be lighter or darker, because all snakes are individuals. But this is the basic pattern. 
but you can see how it's not rings, it's actually just blotches along the top. So yeah, gopher snakes look a lot more like rattlesnakes than king snakes do. And with that mimicking, how they pretend to be a rattlesnake as a defense. Um, oh, really? They do? I didn't know that. Yeah, they will coil. Same with these guys. These guys will coil too and they'll shake the end of their tail uh, because some critters may not know the difference of the, of the design. Snake. Yeah, um, one story uh, with rattlesnakes and snakes that I like to tell, we did have a snake on residence, um, oh gosh, for a long, long, long time. He passed away about two years ago, and we don't know how old he was. He was a gopher snake, and his story was that some boys found him on the trail and thought he was a rattlesnake, and instead of just giving him his space, they grabbed sticks and started to beat him with sticks to kill him. Ranger came up to the boys and saw what they were doing and stopped him, but that uh, snake, who was later named Weaver, Weaver, he lost his eyes. His whole head was deformed from what the boys did to him, and he couldn't be released back into the wild as a result. And he was just a gopher snake. He wouldn't have harmed anybody. Um, but like I said, th these guys, I know that they creep people out. They don't have legs, and that kind of is EBG for a lot of people. Um, but they are so beneficial to us. They really do help the balance out there in nature so much. Even rattlesnakes do. And there's something we need to be cautious about. As cautious as we are crossing the street, as cautious as we are on a stove cooking food, I mean, there's lots of dangers around us that we don't get rid of, that we just are cautious about. And it's the same thing with rattlesnakes. We don't need to get rid of these guys. We just need to be cautious about them. And again, here in Sacramento Valley, we're so lucky that we have ones that are just so mellow in the sense that they're, they are willing to give you that space. If you give them the space, they're like, cool, I don't want to mess with you. I'll, I'll go this way, you go that way. Perfect. And that's how our snakes are here. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you so much. You were a great group. Thank you.